Hi, it's Robin. I've had a number of donations to the channel over the months. I'm a big fan of Adrian Black's channel, and he's been doing these uh, midweek mini mail calls, as he calls them, even though some of them are like 90-minute videos. And so I thought I'd take a look at the things I've received, show them to you. I need a catchy name for it if anybody has any suggestions. 8-bit mailbag, 8-bit hand-me-downs, 8-bit handoff. When I receive packages here in Canada, they're almost always international from the U.S. and beyond. So they're just absolutely covered in personal information, tracking numbers. Both my name and the sender's name appear like three times on here. So trying to cover that up is, is just ridiculous. So anyway, <laughs> this, is, this is my solution. So I've got three things that arrived in the mail, plus a very large local donation that we'll look at last. All right, here we go. This box is from Dane in Pennsylvania. Mmm, clever. This is some expert packing here. So here we have Commodore 64 data file programming. I love the art on these 80s books. This is like a, what, a street vendor, a hot dog vendor. He's got a little Commodore 64 on a cart there. I think that's a C64 anyway. This easy-to-follow self-instructional guide shows you how to program and maintain data files for your Commodore 64, Commodore PET, or CBM, and use them to keep track of billings, inventories, and expenses. Catalog material mailing lists manipulate numerical and statistical information and more. So yeah, I collect Commodore books, and uh, especially, well, really anything to do with Commodore 64, actually any Commodore 8-bit, and I collect books about pretty much any 8-bit computer, really. Now, I have a lot of Commodore books already, so it's starting to get hard to find ones I don't have. And this is this is one I didn't have. So it seems like a very in-depth book about handling data, cassette tape data files. Actually, let's look at the index here of the contents. Writing basic programs for clarity, readability, and logic. An important review of basic statements. Building data entry and error checking routines. Cassette tape data files. Creating and reading back sequential data files on disk. Sequential data file utility programs. Relative data files. Relative file applications. Final self-test. And then a number of appendices. Including the differences between the PET and the C64. That sounds kind of interesting. Differences between the PET and the C64. This appendix covers the program and memory location differences between the version 2 of BASIC used in the Commodore 64 and PETs with 2.0 BASIC. As the stars are on the Commodore BASIC there, mostly designated 2001 and with 4.0 BASIC with the hashes on either side from the 4016, 4032, and 8032. Programs written to run in both BASIC 2 and BASIC 4 must not use the following words or their first two letters. That lists all the extra commands that BASIC 4 has. Improper use will result in a syntax error and possibly in destruction of program or file data on disks. And of course, the various peaks and pokes are different. And there's also garbage collection. Yeah, this is something I haven't tested, but this is when you're using strings in BASIC, you've once in a while they have to get cleaned up. And apparently BASIC 4 is really good at it, while BASIC 2 is not. And that, that's something I want to get into sometime. BASIC 4 disk commands. Okay, well that looks like a really interesting book. Maybe I'll look at that in more detail in another episode. Now there's another one in here. <laughs> wow. Now this is really cool. This is Programming the Commodore 64, The Definitive Guide by Rato Colin West. And while I do have a copy of this, I do not have this revised edition. Here's my original one. I've mentioned before that I consider the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide to be the very best. If I could only have one Commodore book, I had said it would be this one. I grew up with this book. I bought this when I was like 11 or 12. Uh, not this exact copy, but this this book my 
originals really beat up. So if I'd said this is the one book to have in an earlier episode, I've since changed my mind. This is still an excellent book. It's relatively easy to get a physical copy of this one still because it was so common. But I have to say this book is even better. Unfortunately, it's fairly rare. But it is available on archive.org to download. But I didn't even know that there was a revised edition. So when Dane offered this, I thought that is... Yes, <laughs> I would totally love that. So the original is from 1985, but you can see here, revised edition, copyright 1987. So I'm not ent entirely sure what's in this new edition, but it says here, this introduction covers changes in the Commodore world since the earlier edition of programming the Commodore 64. Material has been included on operating systems, computers, and peripherals where it's necessary for the overall picture, We'll look at the 128 in detail because of its status as an expansion of the 64. The GEOS, or GEOS, as some people told me I should say, software package is an important development is considered in some detail in the appendices. Okay, so they talk about the 64C. Internally, apart from some tidy up of chips, the 64C is identical to the familiar 64. Uh, also about the SX64. However, the SX64 did not include a cassette port, so the chapter on tape storage is irrelevant. Okay, and then also the Amigas were introduced, but because these models aren't at all compatible with the 64, or with any other previous Commodore computers, uh, because of this they aren't covering the book. There's a section about the 128. Uh, this is about, they mentioned the 128D, that hasn't been introduced into the United States yet. Hmm, possibly because so many 128 purchasers here already have disk drives, so they have no need of a built-in one. Eventually the 128D in the metal case was released in the US and Canada, and that's called the 128DCR, uh, according to the back badge. Cost reduced, but actually better in most ways. Detailed look at the 128 CPM. Oh, and a little section about the C16, the Commerce 16, and the Plus 4. They were not very successful, but deserve some mention. <laughs> Peripherals, printers. Okay. Ah, section on RAM expansion modules. So really it seems that this new edition has this new introduction. Oh, discussing about how save with replace has a bug in it, so it's best not to use it. Turbo loaders. And they talk about how the chips in the 64 are better than ever. The noise levels have been reduced. Yeah, and that's something you remember that the C64 just kept changing, uh, even though it was generally very compatible throughout the run. They did keep improving it. And I think all these sections are the same. And then at the end, I mean, we could go through and compare page by page. I noticed that here in the new one, chapter 17, uh, the last section is on page 561 in in both books. This is the original. So they probably did not want to go to the expense of changing the main body of the book to lay it out again. So way at the back here, page 608. Right, Geos and Overview. There's a section there, Appendix T, U, and finally a Geos Memory Map. So that's really cool and I think extremely rare, this revised edition. So Thank you very much, Dane. Those are excellent. All right, so next up is this big box. That's actually quite light from City Zen, who have an interesting YouTube channel. I think I know what this is. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, and this was actually sent quite a while ago. I've been saving it for when I finally did a video like this, it's taken me months. Yes, yeah, so this is City Zen from Douglasville, Georgia. Dear Robin, thanks for inspiring us with your great videos and internet presence. Well, thank you. Here is a little token of our appreciation. This tombstone was used in our 2019 Halloween special video in the intro greets section. Yes. <laughs> so yes, look, it is a tombstone, 8-bit show and tell found a killer bug after 30 years. And what's hilarious about this, this, as Seth says, 
they made this for the intro to one of their videos, and they had this whole graveyard scene with some other YouTubers in there. And I'll show a little clip of it here, but <laughs> it's hilarious. So I'm in there in a paraphractic, and <laughs> anyway, very elaborate intro. I was really, really flattered. It was pretty hilarious, even though, it, you know, here's my death. That's okay. So anyway, check out City Zen. I'm going to put a link in the description. Some of their videos are super elaborate. They put so much work into them, and they really deserve more, more viewers, more subscribers. So if you haven't checked them out, go ahead and do that. It's, some of their stuff's weird, <laughs> but there's probably something that you'll like there too. So anyway, check them out. That's great, guys. And what else does Seth say here? As a side note, we want to tell you about a project we were working on before the video about the hidden program on the album record. The project would involve creating a demo for the Commodore 64, then having the audio of the tap file pressed onto a vinyl album, which could then be loaded into the 64, a little demo called Vinyl. Well, that'd be really cool. And a little spoiler, I think it's all being delayed because of the, the pandemic, but I actually coded a demo that might be showing up on vinyl sometime this year. I, I hope it happens. <laughs> anyway, thanks for sending that, Seth. That's really cool. And keep up the good work on your channel. Okay, and next is this little box that I also got quite a while ago. And I actually had already opened this one because I had been working on a video about it. And for various reasons, I just couldn't get that video done. And so just sort of sat there, but I still really appreciate this. So I still just want to show it. So this is, this is from Philip at Knox Butte Technologies. And this is a product he, he had on the market for a little while, but actually I was just talking to him again. And he doesn't currently have anything for sale, but still, I'm just going to show it here. So it's a user port prototyping kit. And here's the little guide on how to use it. Here, I'll show what we sent. So there's this little adapter here that, you know, he 3D printed. It goes into the user port on the back of the Commerce 64. That's the one that doesn't get much use nowadays, but that's where people would plug modems and all kinds of things. So it's just a female end on both. And then the idea is that it has this edge connector here, which you, you know, which you plug in here and then into the 64. And this allows you to plug it onto a breadboard, such as this little one I have here, that actually he sent this along to. And the idea is that you can hook little breadboard projects up to the Commodore 64, then you're able to write a program on the Commodore and then control them. I also sent along this little prototype board here. So yeah, I actually started making a video about this, but I was so clueless. <laughs> so I, I put this little thing together with his guidance and, and a couple other friends uh, gave me some suggestions. But when it, came, when it came time for me to record a video about it, I was not able to confidently explain what was going on. Uh, I tried, had some trouble with it, and anyway, I ended up shelving it. But this sort of thing does deserve its own episode sometime. I'm just not sure I'm the person to make it. <laughs> So if there is an existing good user port video, then uh, let me know in the comments. And if there isn't, then maybe I will try and make it uh, after all. The idea here is just that this is a little 4-bit counter, and the 64 can detect the button press here, and then change the status of these lines so that the lights light up. You know, different, you could do different things with it. Also, some of my friends who are way smarter at hardware than I am uh, we're arguing about whether resistors are needed or not. This kind of thing's really interesting to me, but it's also kind of risky in that you could damage your Commodore computer. Whether this is a, a practical thing to do now or not, the fact is, at the time, people would use, well, especially the VIC-20, but also the Commodore 64 for these kind of projects. You know, nowadays there's Arduinos and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, maybe maybe that's a better way to learn, but... This is like a nice, uh, this is, <laughs> this is the vintage way to do these sort of experiments. Okay, so thank you very much to Philip for sending that. Sorry I didn't get that on the show sooner. Let us know when you have new projects ready to be sold through your website or on eBay or whatever. Well, yeah, I didn't explain that. The reason for this is that, you know, there are other prototyping boards like this available 
but they would need a female edge connector here, which is a more expensive part. So what this adapter lets you do is just keep this on the computer side, and then you could buy multiple more inexpensive boards if you're doing more than one project at a time. So this part allows this part to be cheaper. Anyway, that, that was the idea behind it. It's a sound idea. Okay, and the final thing we're going to look at today is all this stuff. This was given to me here in Thunder Bay. Don Sutton used to run a Commodore computer repair business way back in the 80s. Well, actually, he didn't just repair. He sold new upgrades and peripherals. Well, whatever. He had a computer shop that ran out of his house. In fact, when I bought my first Super Snapshot, it was because he recommended it. And boy, was he ever right. Still have the box for it here that I bought here in town. Canadian made, eh? And Don also ran a bulletin board called Electronics 2000. And he was a sysop, obviously, of it. Going by Dangerous Don, <laughs> which is an awesome handle. So anyway, he's retired now. And because of the pandemic, I think he was just cleaning up his garage. And he has had a few things. He's got rid of almost everything to do with the business. But he still had some stuff left. He called me up. He knew I was still into this and said he wanted to give it to me. So, of course, I was I was there. <laughs> so, I don't really know what's here. I suspect it's kind of odds and ends and not necessarily stuff that's in good cosmetic shape or good repair. But there's probably still some interesting stuff here. So, you know, I, can't, I can hardly even fit it all in the, the camera here. So, I'm, I'll take some of the stuff down. We'll start looking at one by one. All right, so what's this? A switching power supply. Or at least that's what the box is. I guess I should assume that's what it is. Okay, this looks... Yeah, this looks like probably an Amiga power supply. Oh yeah, there you go. Stock PS number 102, model number DSP A500, switching power supply by Suntron. So that looks like it's brand new. Third-party Amiga power supply. Cool. I think I'm going to leave that in the box, but maybe I'll give that a try if I ever make a video with my Amigas. Cool. Next is this box. 15412 disk drive with Kmart stickers on it. Kmart sold lots of Commodore equipment here in Canada. I think they did in the States as well. It says up here $349 with a X through it. Anyway, the box looks nice. I've never had a 1541-2 box before. I've got disk drives. And here we go. That does not look like a 1541-2. That looks like a 1571, and it is. Pretty nice shape, but it is a little bit beaten up, so it's, it's obviously being used. Oh, look at that. That is Don's sticker from back when he had the business. Electrox 2000 Computer Repairs and Accessories. Call for service. So maybe this is a disk drive that was out for repair and the customer never paid or never came back and got it or whatever. So, well, there it is. The 1571 was intended for the Commodore 128. When hooked up to Commodore 128, this is a very, in Commodore 128 mode, this is a very fast drive. And it also is a double-sided drive, meaning it can read both the top and the bottom of a properly formatted disc to get, as if it's one single disc, one single volume. So you could store 340K instead of just 170K on a disc, but it would use both sides. Anyway, very nice disc drive. All right, next is a Commerce 64 box. Pretty beat up, but I've seen worse. And what's inside? Ooh! It is a 64 inside. All right. Hey, it's got the classic old brick in it. <laughs> Look at that. That's some styrofoam stuck right to it. The chemical in these power cords can leach out and like interact with the styrofoam if left long enough. Anyway, generally I do not use these bricks. You never know when they're going to die and 
I mean, if you have no other choice, then, then you can use it, and it's a bit of a gamble. Now let's see the 64 looks pretty nice. That's a bit yellowed, <laughs> but overall, looks great. Looks good all around. It's funny when they started making these bigger badges that didn't fit in the original shape and they started slapping them on. This Commodore had to fit too much information to put them in the proper place. So that's one of these P serial numbers there. Pretty high serial number. So yeah, it's pretty clear this top and bottom probably are from two different 64s. Or at least the plastic came, uh, was made from a very different batch if it yellowed so differently. But still, that is a fine looking 64. I love that. Welcome to the world of friendly computing. Okay, and another box. A bit nicer shape, although it's got writing on it. It says Office. It has the serial number on the sticker there. Well, this is that awesome. I wish I had a 64 with a power sticker like that. Look at that. That's awesome. And what is in it? Oh, not a 64, but some other goodies. So even though there isn't a C64 in this, this is actually a pretty nice box for one. But nowadays, because I have, uh, you know, a decent number of Commerce 64s already, I am happy to get other odds and ends. Sometimes they're even more interesting. Okay, so Human Torch and The Thing, Quest Probe. I don't know if I've ever played the Fantastic Four game. I played that Hulk one and the Spider-Man one a lot. I don't think I ever played the Fantastic Four one. It's hard to get that shiny label on camera. Fantastic Four game clues. Oh, spoiler. That's cool. I don't have that. I didn't have that before. Wizard and the Princess. Load and go software. I don't think I played that. Ooh. Mastertronic Five Aside Soccer. That has the disc. So this is a game that I could have sworn I owned when I was a kid, but I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> the plastic's all wrinkled, kind of gross, but <laughs> but this game is memorable. It was kind of fun, but every time there was like well, what I call the face-off, because I'm a <laughs> I'm a Canadian, I only know hockey terms. We call it, you know. Okay, anyway. A soccer face-off, a football, uh, a football face-off. They would sing this, here we go, here we go, here we go song. That was like this long digital sample that I guess was cool the first couple times and then just got so annoying. So anyway, I like how Master Truck had these uh, cartoon, cartoon covers with the, uh, you know, with the speech bubbles here. So that's cool. Ooh. Sargon II, the computer chess champion. Is the disc actually in there? Oop. Oop. There's a very faded disc label. Can hardly make that out, eh? Well, there we are. There's Sargon 2, the C64 disc on the back side, and the Apple one on this side. Instruction sheet. There's an envelope. I'm always happy to get more boxed software that I don't have. Yeah, Vic 1541 disk drive manual. When the 1541 was first released, it was branded the Vic 1541. And then they started just calling it the Commodore 1541 when the Commodore 64 came along. Basically the same machine, but they did go through revisions and probably different versions of the ROM. 
And so there's another C64 programmer's reference guide. It's going to be covered in plastic, I guess, to protect it. That's a classic PRG. 15412 user's guide. I think I've shown my 15412 before. It's just a, it's a 15401 compatible, but it's smaller. Seems more reliable. C64 user's guide. That was packed in. Okay, another 1541 guide. The 64C system guide. So this is the different pack in. When the 64C came out, they wrote a new manual for it. I don't think I've ever actually read this one in detail before. I grew up with the blue one here. Oh, and the back of the book are some other pamphlets. I love this stuff. I collect all these. Please read first. Oh, Commodore, Low, Commodore 128 Quick Start Guide. RCA Service Company. This is about your warranty. Commodore Authorized Warranty Repair Locations listed by state. Oh, here's where you bring your Commodore if it's broken. Amazing to think that there are that many places back in the day. Probably all gone now. Business reply cards, another warranty card. Oh yeah, the program license agreement and limited warranty. <laughs> Even back in the 80s, there was this attempt uh, to do these licensing agreements. A little pamphlet of Commodore 64 hardware and software. Commodore, years ahead of the competition. Pretty cool, neat little brochure there. Oh, there's the... Hey, they call it the C1702 monitor, the C1541 disk drive, the Commodore 64, MPS 801. How to become computer literate. Commodore 64 product comparisons. C64 versus the Apple II, IBM PC Jr., and the Atari 800 XL. Showing the prices at the time, C64 was down to $219, while well, Apple IIe was 700 the PC Junior was 670 and the Atari 800 XL was 299 Commodore Information Network and what's in here Wow big Commodore 64 software for your most important computing needs showing all the stuff that was available Games, magazines, arcade, magic voice speech module, the infamous Jack Attack. Apparently that was not the game's original name, but Commodore employees renamed it that in, I don't know if you want to say in honor of Jack Termill, but I don't know if I had that one before. Okay, C64 introductory guide. Okay. Video cables. There's the original switch box that the 64 shipped with, so you could choose between computer or TV. You put this in line, so it was easy to switch between your computer and TV. So nowadays, if you are trying to hook up your 64, or actually any, like an Atari 2600, uh, anything, like on the C64, you should be using the composite output instead, if at all possible, or get it like a S-Video cable. If you are stuck with using RF, Instead of using this, get one of these little adapters that goes from RF to the coaxial. This has a much cleaner signal. This thing makes all kinds of noise, so they're a cool piece of computer history, but don't use them anymore when you got this and, and many other better solutions now. And anything in there? Nope. Well, that's, that's the little box that the power supply and cables used to come in. Okay, that's cool. And to go through that big bin, Here's a couple 15412s. Pretty grungy, I'll clean them up after. Another advantage of the 15412 is that it has this device switch, so you can switch between device 8, 9, 10, and 11 without having to like modify your drive. The original 1541 was just stuck on device 8, and you had to either, well, there was a software hack you could do 
they had to do that yeah, every time you power cycled. And here somebody's written device eight is both up, up is on. And here's another one that's in a plastic bag with the power supply. What does it say there? Repaired at com spec. Drive is excellent. Okay. Also in that bin is a pretty nasty looking 60. <laughs> it's pretty nasty looking 64C here. Oh wow. Some of those keys are just like right loose. That one there. Well maybe yeah, if you oh wow. And something something nasty happened there. It looks like it got dropped or something. Had some damage here. But this might have something interesting inside with that. Some sort of mod there. Okay, so nasty looking 64C, but could be could be useful. Good for parts. I have some local friends even who have been looking for keys. And here's another C64 bread bin. Good. Oh, crossed out. Suspect bad PLA, return key bad sometimes. Okay. Well, cosmetically in pretty nice shape. Just a bit dirty. And this is the last big item in that box. Good computer mine. Missing 82825. Oh, it's kind of torn off there. So again, this could use a good cleaning. A sticker on the side there. Not sure what that means. 60189. Oh, control port printing is kind of blurry there. I don't know if I've ever seen that before. Well, it looks on the camera, but the right hand one there is. Oh, it's like thicker or something, or like it got smudged. <laughs> this is what I'm used to, the thinner printing. Interesting. Okay. Doesn't seem to have anything unusual about it. Oh, 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 okay, cool. Yeah, and this is one of the relatively rare made in Canada Commerce 64s here. Number SC162235. So that's cool. Actually, I think most of the 64s I have were made in the US, but I don't have all that many that were made in Canada. So that's really cool. And actually that's one that I'd be more interested. You know, this, this is a computer that I would definitely try to get going. And just a few more, last few things here. And that's it. Here's the power supply for the 1541-2. 1571.2 and the 1581. So 1581 is the three and a half inch disk drive and the 1541.2, I already showed you that, but this is pretty cool. The 1571.2 never did get, get made. Presumably it was going to be a smaller cost reduced 1571, just like the 1541.2 was. Every once in a while, these rare things snuck out a Commodore, like the disk drive itself <laughs> didn't, but that it got put on power supply because it was intended for that. Some of these actually say C65 on them for the legendary Commodore 65 computer because it also used this kind of power supply. I think I have one of those somewhere. Okay, and this little guy is also a power supply for the 15412. It's really grungy in there, but it says 154812, 1571, 2, and 1581. It's just the the same. So these are equivalent, but this one's quite a bit smaller. I don't know if this one's repairable or not. No, it still doesn't have any screws, so that seems to have some vents there. I don't know which one's more reliable. And finally, this little box is the last thing. It also says switching power supply. Okay, now this has a five pin. What does it say? Skynet. <laughs> awesome. No user serviceable parts inside. 
um, SNP05I or 1 input doesn't have a check mark whether it's 115 or 230 volt output plus 12 volts at 1.5 amps minus 12 volts at 3 amps and 5 volts at 2 amps well that looks a bit crusty oh it's actually tape on there so it's ground plus 12 minus 12 and 5 volts well i went and looked it up and Whatever it is, it's not for Commodore equipment. It's, I think, for some sort of communications equipment. So it's still kind of cool having 12 and 5 volts on here. C64 needs 9 volts and 5 volts. So uh, this is probably just something else he had around the shop, and I just ended up with it. But who knows? Maybe this will power something else someday for me. All right, so thank you very much to Don for that. That was about as many as one of Adrian's mail calls, but... Thank you to everybody who donated these items. If you haven't already, please do subscribe and don't forget to check out City Zen's channel. There'll be a link in the description below. Thank you to my patrons for the support in this channel. You can check out my Patreon link also below. Thank you for watching and we'll talk to you next time. My Commodore 64 came with the switch box, a small metal box with the switch. Rabbit ears attached at one end and at the other, the Commodore 64 plugged in. Box had two leads. They attached to the back of the TV to the VHF terminals. Tighten the screws, and between the C64 and the TV, I could choose. in my room Computer and cartoons If I just had my own fridge full of food and my own bathroom I could stay in forever